welcome to the Carson City Culture and Tourism Authority uh, Board of Directors meeting. It's Monday, October 11th, 2021. We're in the Carson City Community Center in the Robert Bob Kroll boardroom. Um, can we get a roll call, Linda? Yes, Mike Jones. Present. Bobby Rader. Here. Stacy Giomi. Here. Steve Kim. Here. Steve Reynolds. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can I ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Um, this time, I'll ask for any public comment. Is there anyone on the line? There are no callers on the line at this time. Um, seeing no other public comment, um, we'll move on to item five, approval of the minutes of the September 13th, 2021 CTA board, member, board meeting. Um, any board member have any changes or corrections uh, for the minutes? If not, uh, can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, and uh, passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, would any uh, member of the board like anything pulled from the consent agenda? Any individual item for discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll ask if there's any member of the public that would like any portion or item move, uh, removed from the consent agenda, pulled from the consent agenda for individual discussion. Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Make a motion to accept the consent agenda as, a, as accepted. Can I get a second? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, uh, passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to for discussion only. Um, item nine, a presentation on the 2021 travel trends by KPS3. Um, I think we have Andy. Can you hear us? I can. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. All right. I believe I need to be able to share. Andy, it's Dave. Just give me one second. I'm going to make sure that they got the permissions for you. OK. And if not, um, we could also run it, I'm assuming, locally. If And I could just blink three times to you know, switch slides if that's. Andy, you're all set. You're all set if you want to share your screen. OK, let me see if my computer will allow it. Uh, it is not letting me. Hmm. Oh, one second. My apologies. I'm going to have to log in and log back in to be able to update permissions. So uh, give me one second. Chair, if I might, uh, Dave Peterson, Executive Director, CTA, for the record. Uh, while Andy's trying to get back in, uh, a couple of us had a great opportunity two weeks ago to sit through this presentation, and I thought the information contained in here was extremely relevant, and I felt the board should be aware of some of these issues. You know, we've got challenges in here, but I also think they're offset with some opportunities as well, uh, not just, you know, for, for tourism in the general sense, but also for Carson City. And there's some things that we already have underway. Lydia's actually talked about a couple of these things as well, some challenges that we're overcoming with uh, data as well. And I just thought it was a 
a great presentation that Andy gave to us a couple weeks ago. So that was the idea behind uh, bringing this in front of the board. So with that, uh, Andy, are you you set? I believe I am now. Um, so without further ado, can everyone see my screen? We can. Excellent. All right. Well. Apologies for having to do and run a support for the beginning of this meeting, but everything worked out. So, uh, so again, Dave, I think you, you did a wonderful job of at least setting things up and being able to see some upcoming travel trends that, that will essentially have an effect on overall on, on Carson City and among those uh, within the overall travel industry as well. And Hi, so Andy. We're seeing your notes screen. So is there any way you can make it a full screen? Oh, end. yeah. Uh, let me do this real quick. Let me try. I could switch that over. Again, on the tech support. <laughs> um, let me actually do my screen. Thank you. I know this isn't stressful at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, just... I think if you just go to the home. there we go there we go better? perfect thank you Andy you okay perfect all right and I charge for Windows IT and Mac IT after this call I'll give everyone my information um, okay so going into uh, some of the, the privacy pieces that that we are looking at from a marketing standpoint and really that for us is being able to balancing a personalized experience versus a being able to obviously protect uh, people's privacy in really the, the same conversation. And so as we've seen technology really move as the pendulum has shifted to being and giving up too much information, now technology is pulling back and saying, we need to be able to protect our consumers' privacy. And, and this is a very much uh, needed update, but we've seen these updates that have started to to roll out across the industry. So the biggest one that we may all be aware of is the iOS 14 updates. And essentially what that is, is Apple has now uh, removed that ongoing uh, ability for people and apps to be able to share information without you knowing. So other applications can't share data with other applications. And so now you're having to opt in to allow your information to be shared, which is a way better usage and at least being able to inform the user that your information is going to be shared with these outsiders. Um, in addition to that, uh, Safari has already rolled this out, but where they're also phasing out third party cookies. And alongside of that, Chrome is going to introduce this update here in the next, uh, supposedly next year, but they keep on pushing that out. But that'll have a huge effect as well because Chrome is obviously the, the largest and most leveraged used browser. And so that'll also affect us and allowing those to uh, that information to be shared. And so how does that affect us? Well, one, um, it will affect uh, the ways that we are able to market from a display side and a retargeting side. So essentially, uh, now we have to reshift our strategies to more of contextual marketing. So instead of being able to say, this person looks like they're and have an intent to travel, we now have to say, okay, well, now we're gonna have our ad show on travel-related blogs, and things of that nature that are looking for people that are already um, on uh, content that is related to the services that we want to be able to target for. In addition to that, that'll also affect how attribution is measured. So beforehand, we would talk about how many digital data points that we needed or how many touch points we needed to be able to help convert people to, uh, to be able to book a hotel stay. Now that's going to go and, and be really that last touch point that we can then um, connect people with. But really, that's, that's really a response to companies being able to take way too much information. And I use this example of face recognition that we necessarily thought, you know, for example, when we're logging in, it's only looking at our face to be able to be able to log into your applications. But they don't. And, and really what that is, is they also take where you're actually logging in from your face. Uh, and so they're taking in their environment. In addition, they're also looking for products that are behind you. So they could be able to target uh, you with with different ads. And so that is one of the you know, violations of privacy because you thought that they were just looking at your face where they're actually consuming all this information around you to be able to target you with you. But that does give you an opportunity to help build trust as we move away from third-party data. And now we are the managers of our customers' data. 
And so we need to protect that data bar none. But in addition to that, though, we also need to tell people why we're collecting that data. So sure, you know, we need your first name and your email address. We want to send you marketing messages. But then, you know, as we're starting to build trust and build relationships, we can say, okay, well, when's your birthday? Because we want to send you a promotion on your birthday. Or, you know, we want to be able to understand where you live and that'll be able to help target, you know, with us for better marketing. And so as you're asking for additional data, there has to be a trade off from the marketing side. And then that help, uh, essentially builds trust as you're being able to be more transparent and why you're collecting that data. So privacy is going to be a big thing, uh, not only for this year, but for years uh, upcoming as well. Um, so now we're going to move into some of the post COVID trends and what essentially has come out of uh, 2020. Um, and so there have been some positives from at least the travel and tourism side. Um, so some of those things are here to stay. So as restaurants have started to expand their outdoor dining, they've looked to be able to go into their parking lots, they've expanded out into uh, sidewalks. People have loved having that ability to go outdoors. Uh, I say that on the coldest day that we've had this year, uh, but essentially people really enjoy that, 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 um, that ability to be able to, to choose where they sit. Um, in addition, we'll see you know, where to go alcohol sales. It is a nice to have to be able to order everything under one menu, um, but essentially that's still a prevalent as well. The second piece is if anyone's traveled um, anywhere in the past or at least has stayed at a hotel over the past uh, few months, opt-in hotel housekeeping has been a, a change in the industry. And so what that means is that, you know, as people are booking hotels or being able to check in at hotels, they're asked if they need housekeeping. Obviously, this has changed from people saying, no, I don't need it. You know, don't please don't go into my room. But that has been really a response with not being able to staff a hundred percent and also because of COVID restrictions as well. The third element is business travel. Um, leisure travelers and who we used to target with us is now continually changing. Um, they were young, generally tech savvy uh, audience, but now it's starting to uh, also move into younger families and older co uh, couples. And that has really been able, uh, been apparent for that mobile workforce that essentially is, is becoming part of the industry to date. Uh, so now, um, expanding on the the business travel workations there's been uh essentially campaigns that countries have really stood behind to be able to help transition and move their workforce to be able to work remotely for uh, a year so dubai barbados the country of georgia has really asked people to come and stay with them for 12 months to be able to help one continually sustain and boost their uh, economy, but also be able to get people and and follow their passion to travel along with being able to be a remote workforce. Um, in addition to that, hotel subscriptions could also be something that we see as well. Uh, with a, a mobile workforce, there's been one chain that has offered roughly about twenty five hundred dollars per month, and that allows you to stay across all of their their hotel chains. Uh, and so when they're able to do that, that's really targeting that mobile workforce again. And then that allows them to be able to have um, access to all their hotels across the country or, or across the world for one price. And so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves as well. And not only are hotels changing, but there's also been things like Starbucks where they're unveiling uh, places where they can they can roll out workspaces where you can rent for 15 minute increments. So people that are in that mobile workforce they can then uh, be able to go to their, their local uh, Starbucks and then be able to rent a room. Uh, Multi-generational travel is also uh, increasing, which is a response to families uh, being able to uh, want to be able to celebrate, uh, cramming mainly their milestones of celebrations into one large event. Um, so this is, is really something that's going to continue to increase, but that's gonna come with its own essentially uh, travel potential problems coming along with it. So mobility, uh, larger spaces, accessibility, you know, the, what a, a young family needs versus what an older family needs is going to be completely separate. And then safety is still going to be a concern, which is going to be a huge opportunity for Carson City because busy resorts and popular cities aren't something that that really people want to do. But outdoor spaces um, are really something that's going to be important and beautiful. For people that that want to access this. Um, now moving into the the customer journey, um, this is always interesting to me because I always want to understand really what gets people prompted to essentially buy, 
And Google just really looked at this from the traveler's journey to be able to see, you know, what really prompts people to really move into that traveling decision. And so I'm going to use actually a car example here where this is kind of their model of where we're continually exposed to different ads. And so that could be from Ford to Volkswagen to all these different ads. But if there's not a trigger here, then we're not in the mood to buy. And so that trigger can be an expanding family. That trigger can be, uh, let's say, uh, your car breaks down. That trigger can be any one of those things to where uh, you then are moving into that intent to buy. And then we move into this exploration evaluation section where exploration is then moved into where you're more of an expansive mode of, of the looking at things like what are the safest cars to uh, purchase in 2021? What are the fastest cars to purchase? What are uh, the best family cars? And that allows you to expand this giant list. And then that moves into evaluation to where then you're then trying to narrow down and you're looking at like, what's this Ford model versus this Volkswagen model? Which one's the better solution? And then once you've narrowed that down, you may hit another blip where you move into exploration again or you move into in the experience and you're ready to purchase. And so when you're ready to purchase, if your, your customer experience and the overall sales was great on that side, um, then that can actually be a future trigger for you uh, when you're ready to buy again. But right now, um, we're seeing purchase triggers being as, uh, for example, for non-air transport is really being able to see family and friends and then for accommodations it's really for those people that are trying to get away um, so as we're looking at the differences of the different channels um, searches is one of those to where uh, you know we have a user as we're looking at the different ways of marketing um, we have an, a person that's an intent to buy as well as uh, you want to be able to find direct information so search again this is from google it's both useful and there's a high usage. Um, whereas online video and social media, um, there is a lot of information when we're doing video. And so people are seeing this information and may be inspired, but there may not be an intent to buy. But with social media, you know, there's obviously video there as well. And then the targeting options are really high, but it's not going to be as high as search. And then comparison sites and word of mouth, these are channels that are extremely um, useful, but their usage is not as high. And so what these come down are two recommendations is, you know, what is that purchase trigger and, and being able to enact on that and trying to show people, for example, for booking accommodations is really that move to to get away. Being able to stimulate demand is promote flexible cancellations and 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 having people understand exactly what your cancellation policies are. And then being able to appeal to the top emotional triggers and again, you know, connecting with people's desire to get away. And then lowering those barriers and offering deals for, to offer that great value. Um, this also aligned with a lot of what Expedia had mentioned. They do a an annual a travel survey as well. And so, uh, what was interesting to find is that you know there's you know obviously a high demand for travel right now, um, but the you know people are still a little hesitant to be able to book or be able to book a a, a flight. And so the drivable destinations have expanded and now seven and 10 travelers are willing to drive up to six hours. And so that's, you know, essentially as we're looking at drive markets, that's good news for us. Um, travelers who want an extended stay. So this is another opportunity um, with that mobile workforce. You know, if they're booking one week, if can we incentivize them to book another week, you know, with a reduced rate, or if that's even, you know, if they booked five days and they're leaving Saturday, what would take them, you know, to be able to book that Sunday night um, with a reduced rate as well. But um, you know that there's definitely an, a, a nicer opportunity to help push people to stay a little bit longer nowadays. Um, travelers also want to envision their stay, so they may want uh, transparency on your cleanliness, on flexibility, and also being able to describe the neighborhoods around the lodging with you know what great restaurants are nearby, where there are hikes, and so forth. And then you know people are continually looking and being able to envision themselves at your place. So using great photos, uh, using great video is really important as well. Uh, another trend that we're also seeing, and, and this is really a response to the uh, the flexible cancellations, is trip stacking. And there are some some good things and some bad things about this, but people are really they just have a desire to travel, 
and they're booking two to three trips on top of one another. So what that means is, you know, for, for example, we just finished up fall break. Perhaps some people said, I wanted to go to Germany during this time, but if things are still crazy in Germany, um, I am now going to have plan B, which is just going to Los Angeles. And essentially they're, they're using those cancellation apologies to their benefit to say, okay, I can cancel this and then get a credit here. And what unfortunately is the response to this is because hotels and airfare are more about what the, the overall uh, availability is. And so that's increasing prices along the, the industry. So trip stacking has really pushed those, those prices up a bit. And so what now the goal is, is really to, to help keep those flexible cancellation policies, but really we can postpone, um, essentially we want people to postpone their trips if they have plan B instead of canceling their, those trips. Okay. Um, the next movement is really a, a reflection of looking at brand values. And that's really where brand safety comes in. But with COVID-19, with Black Lives Matter, a lot of people, especially a younger audiences, were looking at the values of brands and being able to connect with those brands that really aligned with who they were. And so when you can align with the, the same type of purpose, the same type of values, people are much more likely to be loyal uh, and to purchase from you. And so um, as they were looking through this, it's a good uh, way to be able to reflect on things to say, you know, are we, do we have the right brand values here? And to ensure that we're not only talking the talk, but also walking the walk, we need to ensure that our overall marketing and our overall public relations are really centered on that. So if you're moving into being able to uh, be a champion of the environment, making sure that your advertising and the people who you support aren't you know, necessarily affiliated with oil is something that would be a, a quick connection. The other case study that I like to see, um, which you can also check out is, you know, Disney obviously has gone under um, the hook for a lot of things lately with some of their older um, movies that, that painted people in, in the wrong light. And so they've been continually responding to how to create a better tomorrow. And I thought this was really interesting because they basically acknowledge everything that's gone on, but saying, you know, we're, we're stepping up our game for a better future. All right. Um, now, the last section is going to be just kind of more of a fun and kind of unique experiences that are out there. Um, this is more or less a response to uh, looking at unique resorts and those that are looking for uh, being able to be more integrated with nature. And so there are hotels that have really responded to this rewilding movement to be able to restore nature. And there have been some really interesting and unique perspectives along the way. So um, some of these are, are like this one in Turkey is a roughly a 35K room that's out in Turkey um, that you can explore yourself. Um, and it goes back and was used through the 11th century, but you can book it today uh, or your next trip to Turkey, um, which is a, you know just a wonderful experience, but was part of nature. Um, this other one that launched in Shanghai in 2018 it is a 16 floor uh, hotel and two of those floors actually go underneath that uh, lagoon here. Uh, but what a cool place and it's built off of a cave, uh, which is or built off that uh, cliff right there, which is wonderful to, to see. Um, this uh, Italian hotel is integrated again with uh, some of the the wall or the, the caves that are nearby. If you've ever wanted to stay in the darkest, deepest um, hotel room that you could ever stay, you can go to the Grand Canyon and this uh, hotel room is 200 feet below. Um, this one is also a quote unquote local, but this is in New Mexico. It's right near the, the Four Corners and it's in, uh, it's called Cocopelli's Cave. And then, you know, there's another one um, that is in New Zealand, which is uh, inspired by obviously the, the Hobbit. Um, and the Lord of the Rings, but you can have livestock that are, are really standing on top of your roof, and that's uh, over by the glowworm caves as well. All right, the last point that um, is also really important that we need to discuss is accessibility. And there have been other uh, destinations that have looked at this, and this is a you know really good market for us as well, but Visit Mesa was, um, uh, is a destination that has really promoted accessibility and knowing that, you know, 20% of Americans traveled in the past two years with either a disabled um, traveler or they themselves were disabled is really showing how prevalent uh, this is. And then in that being able to highlight which hotels, which attractions, uh, which events have accessibility accommodations is really important. 
Uh, in addition, you know, our target audience is is baby boomers, and knowing that 40% will age into a disability is is really important because these are the things that they're looking for to ensure that their stay is not is going to be as as pleasant as possible. They also have this uh, little widget too, which is also an extension of of ADA compliance, and so that enhances the experience for people who need screen readers. And so that was a great tool as well for this piece. But something just to be aware of as as people are looking and providing better options for accessibility, that this was a, a great tool to use as well. And so with that, my um, trends and my uh, ability to go through IT at the same time is uh, is coming to a final. But I appreciate the time, and hopefully that was that was uh, entertaining for you. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, it's a good presentation. It always amazes me how when travel habits or any business changes, in this case because of a pandemic, how quickly a business adapts to that and, and changes too so quickly. Um, a lot of interesting stuff. I've seen that, especially in the hotel business, uh, the opt-in, uh, I'm sure, uh, very popular. With that, I'll ask yeah, anybody I had, any I, questions or comments uh, for Andy. No. Well, Andy, thank you. It was a, I thought it was a very well done presentation, and your I, I yeah, think your sharing it. screen skills are just fine. Uh, <laughs> don't, uh, uh, thanks. With that, we'll move on to item ten, um, director's report. David. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I only have one thing just to bring the uh, board up to speed on. We did receive four grant applications and uh, in, in total of $32,500 that were approved uh, earlier this month by the Nevada Commission on Tourism. So we, we received our Expedia Co-op, our Creative Brand Campaign Ad Copy Testing, the virtual tour for the Kit Carson Trail that we previously have discussed, and the streaming television advertising. So, and then exciting news this morning, the Nevada Commission on Tourism, Travel Nevada, just released a second cycle of marketing grant uh, that will have about uh, just a little less than a month to uh, put some projects together for their consideration. So the team and I are gonna meet on that later this week. So that was an unexpected surprise. Um, so I can answer any questions about the grants, but uh, if, if there aren't any, I'll. I'll be happy to just move move forward, Chair. Awesome. Uh, we'll we'll go ahead and move on to 10B. So the transient occupancy tax, actual versus forecast. That's the big 11 by 17 sheet uh, in your packet. Uh, we still are waiting on a couple of properties to come in for the month of August. Uh, if you'll recall, last month we projected about a 30% increase. Uh, if you look at that last row. Uh, over fiscal 19, and right now we're projecting uh, just a little over 26, about 26.45%, so a little bit less uh, than, uh, than I thought, but still a, a pretty reasonable number. Uh, at this point, I have not changed September through June, uh, so I'd like to, like to see where September comes in, and, and hopefully we'll have uh, some numbers to work with at the next meeting. Uh, but for right now, we're looking about 15.3%. Uh, over 19, if you look at that far right, the last lower number uh, for the fiscal year. So again, with 20 and 21 being very weird years, uh, trying to take a look at this as compared to our last normal <laughs> year, I hate to use that word, but uh, which is fiscal 19. So if there are any questions about the projections, I'm happy to answer those. Okay. Uh, seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to 10C, events and sales update. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to James Salanoa to give us an update on the events and sales front. Take it away, James. Thank you. If Andy's still on the call, um, if you ever get a chance to go karaoke with him, make sure that he selects some songs from the 90s. Um, <laughs> he, he rocked it the last time I went with him. Only in the duo. Only in the duo. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
So just to recap on some of our events and um, and sales uh, missions for the past month, uh, recapping some of the sports, we received word um, that the All World Sports, two All World Sports tournaments will be canceling in the month of October due to low registration numbers. Um, Scott, speaking to um, Ed, indicated that uh, COVID kind of messed up their numbers in terms of uh, enrollments, and so that kind of affected their their events. And with the new policies and procedures that the city and Parks and Rec putting together, um, they need to be able to cancel events within a certain time frame. And so that kind of spawned uh, the reasons why they, they canceled much sooner than, than what they typically would do. Um, I'm assuming that's not gone over well with the sports teams, the cancellation policy. Yeah, the it's it's actually uh, a win-win for both sides uh, because it allows Parks and Recs to be able to prepare for uh, the staff and team in order for them to host the tournaments too. So the, the cancellation policy they put in place actually helps both sides just so that, um, you know, all world sports not canceling maybe like the week of, which affects – the food that uh, parks have maybe have purchased or whatnot. So it, it is more like a, uh, a necessary uh, requirement for, for that policy. So it's just something that all war sports is getting used to. No, I think it's a good policy. I just uh, would assume they see it as a takeaway. Yeah, potentially, potentially. Yeah. Um, they, you know, it, like David said, it's, it's COVID year and trying to uh, run consistent tournaments. And, you know, one thing that we've noticed in the past looking at some of the numbers for these tournaments is uh, there's always new teams that participate in these tournaments. Uh, so you can see how new teams may be apprehensive to to participate if they're not really sure if it's going to happen or, or if there's, a, you know, mandates that they have to follow and guidelines that they have to follow might affect registration. Uh, so I think... Next year will probably be a better indication as to what, how policy affects the sports tournaments in general. Yeah. Uh, Chair, if I could just add one thing too. We, we were trying to, based on the feedback that James and I personally had from the different lodging properties, they didn't like the cancellations that were literally happening two days, you know, on a Wednesday or a Thursday for a tournament to start Friday. So we were trying to work uh, with these folks as well to hopefully let the properties know ahead of time, hey, this tournament's not going to happen, so they can go ahead and obviously try to rebook those rooms uh, with, with other types of guests. So I'm hoping that that will benefit the, the lodging properties as well, just so we don't have that situation where rooms are getting canceled on you know, literally Wednesday, Thursday for a tournament that's supposed to start on a Friday. So we're trying to take that into consideration as well. Uh, last month, I had the chance to uh, go to Vegas to attend IPW, uh, International Power, and it was, um, for a first time, it was, it was a very big event. Um, speaking to people that have attended this conference for the past 20, 25 years, they, they say the numbers was maybe one-third of the actual um, attendance that they usually get. But we were roughly around 2,500 people. Uh, in terms of our appointments, which was the main purpose as to why we even attended this conference, we, it was a great success for us to be able to um, reach out to um, pretty much the majority of our appointments was with international uh, tour operators and receptive, op receptive operators, people that we typically would not be able to contact or have any interactions with even at some of the other conferences that we attend because they don't attend those conferences. So for us, it, w it was a win for us to be there and schedule those appointments. Um, a couple of them are also coming to a conference that we're having in Reno in, in February. And so we're already scheduling uh, and working together, trying to put together some tours for them to, so they can actually see some of the products that we have in Carson City. Uh, we'll be partnering with RSCVA to kind of facilitate that, that since they will be... Um, the major partner that we'll be working with. So upcoming, we have a, a conference, uh, NTA. This would be our third year uh, in participating in that, um, in addition to ABA Marketplace, which would be our second year, but our first year uh, in person. 
um, followed by the Go West event um, that is coming up in February. So this, these are our go-to conferences that we typically attend to meet with tour operators um, and try to uh, work with them on getting some bookings here in Carson City. I'll go into some more details about some of these in, in a little bit. But in preparation for that, we wanted to make sure that we aesthetically updated uh, the one sheet that we provide. Some of these conferences were only allowed to provide one document, two-sided, with some details, and then have maybe a three to five minute uh, timeline to give them a quick pitch about uh, what they can do in the region, proximity to some, of the, some, to some of the other regions, and also activities that they could do um, at these, you know, in Northern Nevada. So for us, having this update um, in and working with with Lydia um, to kind of help with the aesthetic look of this um, is really useful for us to take to these conferences. We have some upcoming events, um, and these uh, three are, are ones that we are actually sponsoring. The first one is uh, Forces of Nature which is um, Mary Bennett and her ghost tour that she's doing. She's putting together on the 23rd. Um, David, uh, working with David, we've been able to secure some funding to kind of help with facilitating this event. In addition to uh, putting together some, some uh, marketing dollars to help with enhancing next year's event um, with some of the products that she has requested for. Um, so we're excited to work with her because of Obviously, the amount of uh, unique uniqueness that she provides to to her event. Um, David indicated to uh, to me earlier today a conversation that she had with that he had with our partner up at the RSCVA and how um, they didn't know that she did this and this is something that uh, that art. I don't know if you want to go into more detail about that, but <laughs> sure. Yeah, no art uh, at the RSCVA. Uh, he's going to come down. For this on the 23rd and, and he yeah they didn't even know about this event until last week he's like dave this is fantastic you know we need to figure out a way where we can partner we can be moving people in and out of this and you know just from a group tour perspective as well it's something that uh he was very interested in so uh I'll, yeah and, I'll, I'll and art back. has i mean his his wealth of knowledge been in the sales side of things all the way back in the days, you know, working um, in Las Vegas, uh, he, he understands this world too. So when he sees these kinds of products and he gets excited about them, you know that we're, we're doing something right. Um, we're also working on, I don't know if that mixed up. Our Nevada Day Parade is one of the events coming up. Um, and we're um, obviously working with Ken to trying to get all of his uh, paperwork done, helping him with some marketing. In return, he's also helping us with some of the things that Lydia needs, in addition to uh, us you know, providing sponsorship dollars to help put this event together. Um, a lot more logistics, I think, he's dealing with this year, and so we're just trying to help him navigate that as much as possible. Uh, but we're, we're expecting you know, to, to, have, uh, to get back to the 2019 days of, of having our, um, our parade versus the reverse parade that we tried to do last year um, at, at the college. So this is like our, you know, premier go-to yearly event that, you know, we, we, it's important for us to support, and I know the city supports this too. We also, um, for the past, I want to say four years, Dia de los Muertos with um, the um, Nevada State Museum. We've been working with them and, and Mina to kind of put this event together. And so this is something that's happening the week after the Mad Day Parade. Um, and I just wanted to make you guys aware that this is something that we continue to support. Um, it's one of those events where we're kind of continuing to diversify uh, the products that we support and offer. In the works, um, we, we've had some interesting conversations with numerous people that want to do events. But this most recent one is actually one that we can actually get excited about. Uh, the Bronco Driver Magazine is looking and having interest to host a Ford Bronco Super Celebrations here in Carson City. Um, they were really looking for a June time period, but I told them, you know, the room rates will be extremely high and um, we don't really need an event in June. And so they, they were willing to, to look for a September date. So we were working with Parks and Rec to secure some time 
in September to kind of host this event there. Um, we're expecting anywhere between three to 500 cars. So we're going to be obviously going through the permitting process, kind of guide them through that on the logistics of what they need. Um, I've sent some locations to him as to where we can actually host this event in Carson City. And if things work out, we'll most likely look at a November site visit for him to come through and kind of see the facility, uh, introduce him to some uh, faculty, uh, staff members for the city, just to kind of facilitate that conversation and then move forward for some actual planning. So this, um, you know, we, we come across these all the time, but this is one we can actually talk about because things are moving forward quite rapidly for us. Um, and, all, and the last thing we have is the Great Western Steam Up. Uh, this is a collaboration with the Railroad Museum um, and, Tra and Travel Nevada. They were partnering together to put together this uh, 150th celebration of the completion of the VNT Railroad and the connection to Reno uh, and Carson City. So the dates of that have been finalized for July 1st through the 4th uh, in 2022. Um, so we'll be working closely with them and, and kind of guiding them since they don't really have an events person at the museum, we'll most likely put up uh, a lot more effort to kind of help them facilitate that. And that's that's everything I have to report for. Um, any questions? No? Thank you. Question for James. Yeah, I just would like to throw out, uh, I was with the RSC VA sales team over the weekend, and uh, they were very complimentary of James' effort down in Las Vegas at IPW. He actually stepped in to their booth and assisted with appointments uh, from the RCVA because they had, I guess, doubled up or something and there, there wasn't anybody there. And uh, so Katie said, James, get in here. Uh, start talking, you know, about, about Northern Nevada and Carson City and Reno. Uh, so, so I was very, very pleased to hear that. So great, great work on that, James. Yeah, it helps when, when in order to promote a, a tour, you have to understand the region. And so, you know, working with Katie in the past because of what she used to do before, uh, it made it easy. So it, it was it was a pleasure to do that. And they they paid for my dinner for like three nights, so I figured I had to do something. Oh, so you were saving us money. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, James. <laughs> That's, I hope you had a big steak. Ribeye. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, James. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to 10D, Arts and Culture Update. So with that, Deborah Soul, take it away. Thank you, Deborah Soul here. Um, today I'm going to just tell you about where we're at with the Arts and Culture Master Plan review and update process, um, talk to you about my progress on the cultural mapping project, um, the work on redevelopment special event grants, and ongoing meetings with Carson City cultural organizations. So this project, the Arts and Culture Master Plan review and update, has actually quite dominated my focus and workload over the past month. Consultation processes with all of the three stakeholder groups has been completed, and those were the cultural organizations, the community at large, and the lodging properties. We received 13 responses from cultural organizations out of 16 organizations that were invited to participate, so I was quite pleased with that, and another 30 responses from the community. We held a combined in-person and Zoom, virtual Zoom meeting in which all the lodging properties were invited to participate, and we had eight people attend or participate in that, plus one who contributed content after the meeting. So we are drawing from a total sample of 50 respondents, which I'm quite pleased with. Uh, a presentation of the plan review and update process is actually taking place this evening in a joint meeting after this, um, which you're probably aware of. Cultural mapping is another project that I have continued to spend some time on. I've continued to build out the database with all the information for the cultural mapping project. There's already 150 destinations that will be featured under 12 categories, including cultural organizations, festivals, heritage properties, historic sites, performance venues, creative economy businesses, and public art, to name a few. I would really like to be able to release the cultural map simultaneously with the updated Arts and Culture Master Plan, but because we have to allow time for our external consultants to enter the data, into the GIS system to actually produce the map. 
it may take another couple of months to see the final project. Deborah, can I, <clears throat> can I ask you a question? Do you know off the top of your head, I j and the only reason I brought this up is that it came up at a Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, there's a, a cemetery um, off of Highway 50, New Empire Cemetery. And <clears throat> I just did some quick research. I, I don't think it's listed as a city asset. Um, hmm. I, I, I believe it's privately owned. Really? Um, I, I really don't know that much about it. And the only reason I mention it is because this a citizen mentioned it and, and said that um, uh, they were having trouble getting uh, a family member of theirs who supposedly had a site dedicated for him or her in that cemetery into the cemetery. And they said that the city didn't um, doesn't maintain it. I don't. I don't believe it's maintained. It's it's sort of off highway. It's not easy to find. It's a parcel that's kind of hunked in the middle of other parcels. And if you go down um, Morgan Mill Road um, and head east from um, uh, Empire Ranch Road, um, it is kind of off on the left there. <laughs> So the golf course is on your right, and kind of back up in the middle there, there's a one or two acre parcel that's an old cemetery. And um, I, I I need to do a little more research for this person, but I just I didn't know if you had noticed that in your cultural list of historic sites or. I have not. Um, yeah. I have not noticed that site yet. Although I will be looking for those okay. as well. And if I find anything out, I'll I'll send it to you. So, thanks. I've also been working on the redevelopment special event grants. Uh, they, we had seven applications, I believe, submitted, um, and they're going to be reviewed at a, a meeting this Thursday, a cultural commission meeting this Thursday. And of course, I'm continuing to meet with new members of the arts and cultural community, lots of people. Um, contacting me and uh, learning a great deal about the community. Any questions for Deborah? No. Great work. Yeah, this has been a lot. I know two simultaneous projects going on that are monopolizing her time. So thank you. Good work, Deborah. Right, I do have. Oh, did, yes, did, did anything sure. surprise you with your meetings with the cultural? folks or the hoteliers or the community um, at large and uh, maybe that's not a fair question no I, that's a fair question I think I was surprised at their enthusiasm and their interest the number of people that contacted me afterwards and said thank you I found that incredibly educational and interesting and I learned a lot um, I was really pleased to to see that level of interest in what we're doing with the cultural master plan Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to 10E, marketing and PR update. Lydia Beck, take it away. For the record, Lydia Beck, and I am also having technical issues, so <laughs> bear with me here for a second. You are seeing my first slide, but I cannot access the back end of it. It's not changing. We were so close. We almost had it. I know. I'm looking at Bobby, and she's blaming Bill Gates <laughs> for some reason, and I don't know why. Can you see it? You see it on your screen? Or? I see it on my screen. All right. I think we're in business now. All right. Thank you for your patience. All right, so um, I'll be walking you through the website update, the social media update, PR report, our one sheet, um, and then uh, filling you in on Bandwango and Mopo, which are some new things that are coming our way. So we'll just start with our, our top web page content and the update for September. We had about 42,000 page views, 35,500 of those were unique users. 
And our top 10 list for this month was, uh, of course, our homepage, things to do, the V&T Railway, hotels, uh, the perfect fall trip to Carson City, events, rail bikes, the Kit Carson Trail, and then also our newsletter sign up as well. For our September digital marketing update, our YouTube ads are continuing to perform really well and driving solid traffic to the site. As you can see from picture B, uh, our top driver uh, is YouTube, two from our Google ads that we do every month. Uh, the A picture uh, represents our month summary, and C represents the averages across YouTube as a whole. So that's kind of what we're comparing ourselves to is, is picture C. So you're going to see that our average view rate is a little bit lower than the national average and our CPV or cost per view uh, and our click-through rate is over double the average that we're seeing. And the reason that we do this is because I work with, uh, with Joe Lynn and monitor this weekly and we make sure that we're on the best sites that we can be on. So we filter ourselves from children's sites, from music channels that are just streaming in the background. Um, and we make sure that we're actually getting views on these as much as we can. So um, I wanted to give you an update on that. This is what we monitor on a weekly basis to make sure that our ads are, are being effective and um, on the most appropriate channels that they can be. For our social media update for our paid content, uh, due to the fires, obviously in September was quite a wild month. Uh, for fires and for advertising. So we uh, shut down our advertising for pretty much half of the month in September. Uh, we spend a total of just $1,000, which is basically half of what we normally spend on our paid advertising. It usually ranges anywhere from uh, $2,000 to $2,500 usually. Sometimes on a, a lot slower months, we'll, we'll drop that down a little bit so we can bank up for events, uh, months that maybe have more events in them. Um, so we spend about $1,000, and that includes our arts and culture ad for the V&T. So these ads, and given the spend that we had, actually performed really well. And you can see the V&T ad uh, had over 1,200 landing page views. So it's garnering a lot of interest. And uh, being Dave being on the board, we're trying to see if that's translating to ticket sales. They're not seeing a huge uptick, and they're thinking that's probably uh, due to COVID and mask regulations. And so uh, the buy-in for getting on the train is is not quite there yet, but we're hoping um, this at least gets more interest out. And this was also running in the Sacramento area. And uh, we've recently, um, in October, just dropped that down to the Reno DMA. Um, but hopefully they got an awareness out to, uh, to push some more interest in April and May when they're up and running again after this season. So you actually have some visual of what our ads look like. On the left is a static ad that's just a picture. That's what it looks like on the news feed. Um, and then in the stories is uh, a different view. So we are optimizing our ads for every channel and every format. And we do a variation of these ads uh, for October, changing up the content and the copywriting, um, as well as promoting, obviously, Nevada Day. Um, and our focus for Nevada Day is really promoting it as a weekend uh, instead of just coming for the parade. So um, these are some of the video ads here, these last two ads. So Fall into fun in Carson City from Nevada Day weekend to leaf peeping across the city. We have your perfect trip, fall trip planned. So this was the ad that was actually delivering those landing page views in that top 10 list that you saw a couple slides ago. And these are some videos that Zach put together just highlighting what fall looks like in Carson City. So short and sweet, but a nice teaser. And then this last ad here is our newsletter sign-up ad, um, which also you saw as is one of our top 10 uh, landing page views too. And some of you have seen this ad before. We've uh, got this done back in, I think, early 2019. But also is a good uh, indicator of fall in Nevada Day and uh, gets you excited about coming this time of year with the leaves. So I hope that helps. All right. And for our September PR report, 
Um, obviously, as we mentioned, the fires kind of dominated a lot of our media, but before that happened, we had some great press releases out for all the wonderful events we were supposed to have. Um, but after the fire subsided, um, we were able to arrange for two media fams uh, that covered the future coverage of the ghost walk. So they garnered a lot of um, media with Mary. She did a private ghost walk tour for us uh, for Edible Reno Tahoe, as well as Nora Tart, who's uh, written a few couple articles for us before, and she's from the Bay Area News Group. So we were able to get some some uh, press out about the union and the bank saloon. And then um, given the nature of the time that they were able to attend, it uh, didn't make sense to push the nightly ghost walks at the time. So they got some great assets for next year, which we're very excited about. So our pub value was over uh, $10,642. We had four, uh, five stories this month that we put out ourselves. Um, and then we have a reach of over a million and a unique visitors per month of over 18 million. And the brand pool breakdown was primarily family friendly. And then we had a good split between arts and culture and historical this month too. I won't read you all the articles. I'll have you take a look at those yourself because there's quite a few. Those are all the articles that came out this month that had really strong value for us. Um, but again, Stuart Indian School garnering a lot of the reach. And uh, we also had an article written about Nevada Day that was pulled into Newsbreak and Only in Your State, which are very popular websites. And on the arts and culture side, the First Lady Presents exhibit was picked up by the Las Vegas Review, which also got us some good eyes as well. Uh, along with James and the group tour one sheet, we updated the media one sheet. All of this lives on the visitcarsoncity.biz site so that anyone that needs information or is writing an article or is looking to visit here, uh, this is the highlight reel of Carson City and why they should come. And uh, also just helps them formulate their stories too. So we updated the events mostly and just the visual look and the, uh, the pictures as well. For Nevada Day, we have some exciting things that we have planned. So we have a entire shoot planned with Zach and Trespasser Productions to gather some drone video and photos for Nevada Day. We're also partnering with Travel Nevada on this, so we're very grateful for them for that. So we're able to bring them in to get some fresh stuff, some exciting stuff. They have a, a POV drone, which is a point of view drone, which is an entirely different look and feel of a drone experience now. So you really feel like you're first person flying on the back of that thing. Um, it's much faster. And so we have some cool shots planned if we can pull it off and the balloons go up to be kind of flying around and over and through the balloons to really see if you can capture that experience. And uh, we've been working with Remax to make sure that we can make that happen and do it safely. So uh, we're excited to see what comes of that. But on top of Nevada Day, we're also just going to be getting general uh, fall shots too so that we have something that we can use uh, for the next few years for that. And then we have an influencer plan to come in that weekend to uh, really showcase how fun it is over the weekend for Nevada Day, as I had just mentioned, uh, so that we can really uh, try to push that extra night stay or even just an overnight stay in general, because uh, I know a lot of people are visiting friends and family, but uh, Blinky Man helps promote that because it's such a fun Friday night before, but also uh, the hiking this time of year and the fall colors. Um, so we're really trying to highlight all those things that make Nevada Day such a great weekend. So next we have a biz band wango, which you might be asking yourself, what the heck is that? Um, and we are very excited about it. So Band Wango is allowing us to do a passport program. Actually, the options are pretty endless. So um, it's called an experiential um, passport, and they do a much better job of trying to explain it than I do. So I'm going to play this video for you. My name is Mo Parikh, and today I'm going to provide you with an overview of Banduango DXC, the Destination Experience Engine. Our goal of Banduango is to empower you to deliver unforgettable experiences and drive economic impact to local businesses, all in an effort to help you understand ROI on your marketing efforts. Now, all of your customers are different, whether it's a local, visiting friends and relatives, or a convention attendee, but they're all looking for the same thing convenience, savings, and things to do in your city. 
The Nwango DXC is engineered from the ground up to be flexible enough to tailor experiences to any customer type. Through the DXC platform, you can infinitely organize all things to do. Attractions, museums, breweries, wineries, restaurants, retailers, or any business into passports, trails, and marketplaces. These can be both paid and free. DXC is used by many destinations to create ale trails, attraction passes, savings programs, golf passports, tour and activity marketplaces, and so much more. The possibilities are truly endless with DXC. So we're very excited about this. We had our launch uh, meeting last week to decide what we're going to do, um, and we landed on what we feel like is uh, the easiest to accomplish first to make sure that we have a, a proven passport that we know the most amount of people are going to use before we dive into a lot of the other options that we have. And so we landed on the hungry hikers and bikers. And so our goal is to uh, capitalize on those outdoor trails and those outdoor experiences that, as Andy mentioned, people are really looking for, and then incentivize them to get back into town and into our businesses with coupons and discounts to retail stores and to um, and to restaurants. And so there's a gamified experience where they can check in to the 10 or 15 trails that we'll have available. And if they check in at each one, then they can be entered to win a prize that's a quarterly raffle, whether that's a Carson City weekend getaway or it's a t-shirt, uh, which they have told me people are very excited about. Um, but it really, uh, it, the options and combinations are, are truly endless. And so we're still fine t finalizing a lot of those things, but we wanted to get people out on the trails and experiencing Carson City first. And then the options from there, um, they can also do events. And so we could virtual uh, do a virtual experience for the Taste of Downtown or Brewfest and have all the tickets be paid for through this platform. We could do a virtual and check-in process for the Wine Walk. So um, I'm already talking with the DBA and Downtown Business Association to figure out how this can help them. Um, we're able to realistically pull off anywhere from three to four passports and in a full entire calendar year. And so we hope that if this goes well, we'll be able to continue this program for a long time and really be able to bring a more virtual experience for families and for people who are looking for this kind of thing. Um, one of the things we're even maybe uh, toying with is adding a kid family friendly scavenger hunt on the Kit Carson trail. And we can have um, a mascot, like a talking deer be in the audio for it. And we hide some things along the trail, like little deers and they, they check in and they scan the code that's on the deer. And, um, if they find all of them, then they, they win a prize or something like that. So there's lots of fun things that we could do. Um, lots of ideas that we're throwing around, but we've got this first one in the works that's hope, hopefully will be done by the end of December for sure. So we'll be able to launch it January 1st, um, and then start working on the next one immediately after that which um, we're hoping might be that Kit Carson Trail or an event with one of our partners. So, um, Van Wango's already in the Reno Tahoe market and has been for a little while. So lots of DMOs are jumping on board because it works. And uh, this is the example of the biggest little pass uh, that Getaway Reno Tahoe is doing. So they're actually doing a paid one for $25, as you can see, which gives you uh, really great discounts all around the Reno area at different restaurants too. So um, it's not an app. We are not paying for an extra app. It's actually all a web-based program and then you can save it. And when you when you check out and you uh, get the pass, then it automatically saves on your home screen of your phone like an app, but it all lives on the web browser. So you don't have to be paying an external service or deal with that kind of extra uh, tech piece of it as well. And it's all under our branding, so no one actually ever sees the Banwago name, which is something that was uh, really appealing. And lastly, we have Mopo, uh, which uh, some of you board members might remember when we were still in the big auditorium, they presented to us, and it's a new travel app that uh, combines your interest with things to do in an area and also includes a social aspect piece to it as well. So they are officially finally launching October 14th. And so we were actually the first DMO to ever provide any content for the app. And so they've been utilizing us and we've been partnering with them to really help them get this off the ground because if this takes off, this is going to create some amazing buzz for Carson City. And they've decided to officially use Nevada Day as kind of the launching event to garner buzz around the app. 
So uh, we'll have a lot of chatter about Carson City, hopefully. So we're hoping, uh, helping them promote that. And um, they're going to be having a whole Nevada Day channel, which will have the schedule of events for the day and for the whole weekend. And um, we're really excited about it. So we're kind of mulling around a potential giveaway that might bolster some usage and some social chat that's on the app. Um, with the messaging of being a pioneer of a new of a new social travel app, uh, just making a splash about Carson City, and then Bobby and Mopo and the team and I uh, met with Stuart last Friday to also chat more about how this can help Stuart. They actually have a person on staff that is focusing specifically on cultural activities and making sure that uh, the voice that speaks on behalf of Mopo is. Uh, speaking the most intelligently and most authentically for the people that it's representing. So we're very excited to have uh, the audio tour already on the app. So people have a new virtual experience for the audio tour for, for Stuart and uh, lots more things in the works. And uh, we're hoping that the launch goes really well. So more things around Nevada Day, which I think are exciting. And um, I think it's just cool to be part of a, of a new experience that we hope goes really well, which was at zero cost to us. So that was also a big uh, drawing point of this too. So thank you very much. I almost got you out of here at five, but uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Any questions for Lydia? Awesome work. I'm super it's glad Bobby. that she's doing this, not me, because she understands this technology and just goes over my head. So. Go ahead, Bobby. Yeah, please. Uh, this is Bobby. I just wanted to mention that I was just so impressed with Mopo and they're um, just a very socially conscious company and the fact that they would actually hire a full-time staff person to make sure that the voices are authentic and um, re really representing the cultures is amazing to me. And um, I really appreciate the time they spent at Stewart with us. I do want to mention that... Um, we have decided we will keep the museum open from 1 to 5 on Nevada Day. Great. We're trying to navigate COVID and try to make sure that we can keep everybody safe. But we may try to do a few vendors, but we're still um, finalizing that. So great. Thank you, Lydia, for bringing them out there. Yeah. yeah Thank you for are, your time. They are awesome. I, they I are agree. Amazing. I mean, Good people. Yeah, and it's nice sure. to be in on the front end of this. And, and Lydia, full credit to her for pushing this uh, usage of this, this app. I'll call it an app, but I'm probably wrong about that. But No, that tool. one's actually an app. This is an <laughs> that app. one's Same an app, yeah. Thing. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I really, really excited about the opportunities I think that this brings forward for us for not only, you know, Nevada Day, but for some of our attractions and other events and how we can maybe integrate this in throughout the course of the year. So uh, that and the band Wango, I think, is, is a wonderful addition for us as well. So thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and move on to 10F, uh, future agenda items. Um, any requests from the board uh, for future agenda items can be made at this time. Um, this yeah. is Bobby again. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask the board if they would be willing to consider doing a land acknowledgement at the start of the meetings. Um, and if so, if you'd be willing to consider that, I have a draft of something I can give you to read and think about. And then, um, if so, then we could put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Um, I think I'll refer to council. Uh, I'm not um, quite sure what um, the announcement would be, and I would think that would have to go through the city. Am I wrong there, Todd? This is Todd Reese, Deputy DA. I'm not entirely sure, uh, Bobby, what, your, uh, what a land acknowledgment is. Um, assuming it's like a assuming it's like a par proclamation or something like that, um, I can uh, look into it and double check whether uh, that would be appropriate for CTA to do. And if so, I can uh, uh, circle back around with the chair and, and let him know. Um, this is Bobby again. Um, yes, it is. It's not a proclamation. It's just a statement at the beginning of every meeting. Um, some cities are doing this. Some state agencies are doing this. Some committees. Um, and it's just an acknowledgement that this is this is indigenous land, and I wanted to do that because today is Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and it's just a, a good thing to do. Um, I did um, email Nancy Paulson this morning to ask her about it, and she didn't seem to have an issue with it. She said um, just to request that it be on the next agenda, 
but I do have a copy I can leave with everybody if you want to take a look at what I'm proposing. Um, sure, that would be great. If I could get a copy, that, that'd be great. And I, I, I don't know if you want to give a copy to everybody right now, but uh, because you'd have to then provide a copy to the public as well. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, certainly, if, 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 you'd, like, if you'd like it and uh, the chair is uh, amenable to it, then, and it seems like something that's within the CTA's uh, jurisdiction, then certainly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks, Todd. Uh, I'm like, look at the announcement and then uh, discuss further. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it between the three of you then uh, to come up with that solution. Let's go ahead and move on to 10, oh, unless there are any other board comments, sorry. Oh, seeing none. 10G, upcoming meetings. Our next regularly scheduled meeting, 4 p.m. November 8th, right here in the same room. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, David. Um, with that, we'll move on to item 11. Uh, any board comments or announcements, requests for information? All right, we'll move on to item 12. Uh, any public comment, anyone online? There are no callers on the line at this time. I think we have any public comment here, so I'll move on to item 13, um, action to adjourn. If I have a motion. All right, we're adjourned. <laughs>